event, um, we, everyone in the room and everyone on the live stream, we have uh, five organizations who are going to be speaking about their transformative open data journey uh, today. Um, so uh, how to transform a whole sector. Um, we'll be discussing how their sectors have changed, how sharing data has improved services, how business models have changed, and uh, where e new ecosystems have been established and evolved to support this, this open data transformation. So we're hearing from representatives um, across many sectors. Um, they'll be doing flash talks. We'll have a bit of a Q&A after each um, speaker. And this will be followed by networking and some demonstrations that we have uh, outside. I'm just going to give you a bit of a rundown of some of the work that the Open Data Institute has been doing, um, including our research and development program. So this uh, is a three-year research um, and development program funded by Innovate UK. Um, the aim is to help develop the next generation of public and private services um, and aim to support innovation, improve data infrastructure and encourage ethical data sharing. So we're currently in the second year of the program, um, planning our final year next year. We're, we're focusing on, I'm going to read out a list, so be ready for this, um, because you can come and speak to us after if, if you want to discuss any of the topics that we're going through. Um, open data publishing, open standards, emerging tech, data access and trust, data and, re and re-identification, international trade, open geospatial data infrastructure and agent-based modeling. So again, speak to any of our ODI staff after this event if you're interested in any of those or want to collaborate with us. Some of our projects um, that we're working on on a more ad hoc basis. Um, so working with the Lloyd's Register Foundation to champion the use of open data in engineering and safety um, and using this as a platform to bring together key stakeholders to create a movement of open data champions who collaborate to use data to improve safety around the world. With the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we're helping to operationalize fair data principles in soil and agronomy investments um, in several regions across India, Ethiopia and Rwanda. Um, in the aviation sector, uh, part of, of the Department for Transport, we're doing some work to explore um, what an open aviation sector would look like, um, focusing on the benefits of data sharing, key data infrastructure, stakeholder engagement, key outcomes and challenges the sector is facing. We're also doing further work um, in transport with the Transport Systems Catapult. Um, we're, we're creating a, a, vision, a vision for transport data report with them, looking at the barriers, challenges um, that the sector is facing, reviewing best practice, data sharing successes um, across the sector um, within the UK and globally. Um, and this will inform the UK transport sector open data journey. We're hoping to influence um, some kind of policy with that. Um, yeah, so uh, we're doing some, some work uh, in Nepal and in Kosovo. So uh, in Nepal, we're doing a train the trainer program, and this is um, to train up um, people to, to teach our open data in a day course. So upskilling data capability and engagement. Um, and in Kosovo, we are building a strategic engagement between the ODI and the Kosovo Foundation for Open Society. And this is aimed at strengthening the open data ecosystem across Kosovo. So members, we, we love you. Um, so this is membership and um, peer networks are a central lever um, across the ODI strategy and, and uh, is a central part of around how we operate as well. So for us, it's really essential to build peer networks, share successes and failures and learn new things about the constantly evolving day-to-data -data landscape. So we encourage those who aren't members here today to join. Um, because you get to come to great things like this, but you also get 30% off um, training and ODI events um, and access to our, to our wider network as well. If you don't already know, we're having a summit on the 20th of November. Um, this is going to be hosted by um, our co-founders, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the web, um, AI pioneer Nigel Shadbolt, um, as well as our ODI CEO, Jenny Tennyson. So at this event, we're bringing together people from across governments, businesses, and civil society to discuss major issues of the day, from ethics to trust um, to business models and emerging technology. Again, ODI members get 30% off tickets, and they are selling fast. So um, we've almost reached capacity, so I'd certainly get your, get your tickets now. I'm going to hand over to our head of business development, uh, Mike Rose, who's going to be facilitating the, the panel session. Um, Let's go from there.
Thank you. So I actually have the really easy bit now. So Alex has done the hard bit of introducing the ODI. I'm actually taking off my ODI hat um, and whilst I'm the head of business development, I'm actually going to be talking a bit about the journey we went on um, in, in DEFRA. So whilst it says head of business development there, I'm talking a bit about uh, another change programme. This is the running order of our speakers. Um, we uh, are going to have as, as I said, these 10 minute flash talks, and I'm not going to waffle for very long and hand it straight over to Nadoon to kick us off. Thank you, Mike. So, um, thanks for the ODI to uh, inviting me to have this uh, conversation with you guys. Um, I, I'm um, the, the lead partner for taking Deloitte's. Uh, data and analytics propositions to mainly public sector and transport, but I do uh, work across other sectors as well. The, 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 you know, a lot of my colleagues will probably talk about uh, more about the transformation of, of a sector, best practice and all of that, but I, I thought I'll, I'll share some of my experience and, and, and my observations from the last sort of five, you know, three to five years around we all want to share data, um, especially if you're trying to transform an entire sector. So the context behind what I'm going to say is around uh, multi-organizational, cross-organizational data sharing as opposed to just one uh, large organization. But I think the principles are the same, but if you're actually trying to uh, transform an entire sector, cross-organizational data sharing is critical, and we have been you know, as, a, as, an in, as, as many industries, we have been trying to do this. We have, you know, most people have been successfully making steady progress for the, in the last sort of, you know, even 10 years, but mostly in the, the three to five years. Uh, so I thought I'll, I'll share some uh, observations around things that slows us down as opposed to the, 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 the transformational aspects of it. Uh, but ha happy to take questions uh, after my speech, but also at the end as well. So the first one is what, I, what we call datanomics. So we coined the, the term to, to dis describe the economics of sharing data. So um, I think this is one of the most important factors that you know, an enterprise or, or a, an industry should consider when, when trying to do uh, data sharing. In, in terms of open data with the ODI, we have been you know, engaged in this type of conversation for a long time. But I think I feel lots of the, the, at an industry level, we talk a lot about opening up data. We encourage loads of organizations to open up data, but we rarely talk about the actual cost of you know, open, you know, sharing data, uh, the, the value, the ownership. Um, so, so I think this is you know, rarely discussed, and, but, but I, I think this is one of the things that slows the the, the transformation of a, a, a sector uh, that, that you know, affects the, the transformation in a, in, a, you know, in a very crucial fashion. So the kind of things when I talk to both my clients and, and across industries when we talk about how to tackle this issue, uh, are my, my thoughts on this are you have to, if you're asking someone to you know, share and curate data, you have to recognize that there's a cost to it and even the organization who, who tends, you know, who wants to do it should recognize that there is a cost to it. Some people talk about whole life costs. Um, but equally, when, you know, when someone else trying, if, if you want to consume that open, whether they might be open or shared data, as you consume it, you, you must be able to put a, a value metric to it and say, this is worth this much for me. So therefore, hopefully, it, it, it should create a, a, an you know, a value, you know, economic metric around what's the price or the cost of a, a unit of data, whatever that might be. I think if you think more, more on those lines, people will be able to, uh, to do this much more effectively. More people will, uh, if you value the data, more people will uh, be able to, to pay for it. it. It doesn't need to be hard currency, but it could be a a system that where you know everyone who shares gets some credit and, and you can exchange different uh, units of credit to exchange data. So that's the key sort of concept behind this. Um, and, and I'd love to know your feedback as well as to what, how you guys have seen this happening in the market, but I think it's an area that needs more attention. 
and and people to to put you know think a little bit harder in terms of putting a value against the data you share and and the data you consume the second area is an age old topic i think you know we we talked about this as long as i've been working uh, and and in people even before that as well but it is still a, a big issue i i feel standards uh, in in terms of data sharing so i, I was talking to a colleague of, a colleague who's here even before this speech um not a new problem but i think we we still need to keep driving in at an industry level or even cross uh, industry level to try and uh, try and improve the situation about sharing data in theory at least it can't be you know i, I know pra practical difficulties are immense but how you define a person how you define a uh, and not, you know a car or a, a you know a product that you, can, you know there are standards already flying around in in across many industries but i i feel a lot of the organizations don't make enough of, of an effort to borrow and to enhance uh these data standards um, ac across industries or even across enterprises had we done that i feel uh we, you know the whole data sharing and the the exchange of data and therefore transforming a an industry becomes much much more easier so um my view is we need to try and encourage and and drive the sharing or the borrowing of standards a lot more and adapting adopting and adapting uh data standards but ultimately there has to be a lot more collaboration so rather than trying to say here's my data here's my in a specification if you want to use it you have to use mine in a spend spend a little bit little bit extra effort to try and collaborate uh, across an industry and and we will get much more value out of it i feel last but not least um privacy and security you know really uh, a, a, a major topic that that is being discussed across the globe across all industries gdpr came into effect in may and there are many more uh different uh legislative stuff coming up but also um we we hear a lot about security and you know uh, uh, breaches in security and privacy as well however in order to exchange information in a safe but a, in, and, and and without breaking privacy laws we i, I feel cross in in cross industries and also cross organize at a cross organizational level need to make much more an effect of an effort if you go to an enterprise and ask the the chief security officer or 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 the chief even the chief data officer the default question in answer is in terms of public you know sharing of of data uh most of the time tends to be no what was the question type of a response uh, i feel we need to you know put more effort to you know two two things we can do one is to there's always a way if you if you spend enough time to to work out what is possible and what is not possible so it it doesn't mean that you can't share any data there there will be ways to share uh enough data securely without breaking uh privacy laws uh to 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 add value to a cross organizational cross industry uh transformation effort the second sort of area to 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 look into further i feel is um new technologies again these are maturing technologies things we couldn't do 5 years ago i feel we can do a you know do a little bit more now one area is data virtualization so to give you guys an example in public sector for example uh we talk about citizen centric or delivering integrating integrated services you know combining the the nhs with the the social welfare for example which has been a very uh you know key key topic in the media recently but in order to do that all organized public organizations need to to share data and and everyone's very reluctant to uh share citizen information so there are new tools that are coming out where it allows organizations to keep the data the physical data in their own organizations but with the right level of security and 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 uh, privacy to to able to join it up in a virtual manner so that you can still get value out of it uh, anonymization obfuscation are the techniques that people talk about as well so all in all my sort of proposition and and request uh, for for an cross organizational cross industry sector is to 
to put more effort to think about some of this stuff and, and, and drive, drive the, the data sharing forward and, and thereby enabling uh, a, a transformation of a, of a particular sector. Thank you so much. Happy to take Thank you. Take a couple of questions yeah, now. Sure. So if you can just wait, put your hands up if you ask, uh, want to ask a question and just wait for the microphone to get to you. Um, you won't hear your voice amplified, it's for the internet, um, so. I'm Michael Spry. Um, the, the question I've got is, how, how does all this tie into the life cycle that data goes through? It's created and it's maintained or updated and then eventually it's, it's deleted. So data has some sort of shelf life. How does that tie into the sharing of data? So if, if I get your question correctly, uh, if you look at a cross-organizational sharing of data, that's sort of a life cycle. I think as you set up the sharing, you need to be very clear about, you know, when is it shared and, and when, is it, when, is it, when, the, when that data needs to be taken offline and, and sort of destroyed or whatever that might be. So the, the, the entire life cycle and where the value is delivered as well. Am I answering your question? Yeah, but there's also the in in the meantime, data is updated or main, maintained. So you you share it with somebody, and then maybe a week later, or a day later, or a month later, it's it's out of date. Yeah. And how does one handle so, that? So, so in addition to what I just said, the second area to, to to give that level of sort of information is the the standards and the metadata that you use to describe the data that you're sharing as well. Some sets of lots of, you know, most sets of data that most organizations share today are relatively static. So, but, but it, it does have a, a cycle, so whether it's a month, three months, or a year. Uh, organizations like TFL, for example, share live traffic data, right? So that, that, that is much, much more near real time. So to answer your question, I think in the way when you share your data, the, the, the way we set, set these th systems up is to always describe the the you know, the, the, the the time time uh, status of, of how, you know the validity of that data during a certain period. So, is it accurate to the last you know two minutes or is it accurate to the last three months? If you describe the data you share with that type of metadata, I think you, you get get over that problem. I need the microphone for the uh, our it's friends for the, on the web. It's, it's for the web. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. On the data standards slide, uh, it seemed focused on standards around sharing of data. And I wonder if you can comment on standards about types of data. Uh, you've used the term metadata in your last answer. And I wonder if you think that the current way uh, data standards describe different types, say types of metadata is sufficient. Um, can you give me an example of your definition of types of data? Um, well, I've come across a, a number of, of types. Often it, it's about the sort of domain usage. But I, I'm yet to come across really clear policy that presents taxons for types of data, types of and user and types of use. So, yeah, so I think there are varying degrees or level of, uh, level of sophistication in the way you develop your standards. So I think, you know, if you look at an industry, if there is no standard established at all, uh, the evolution of it will be to first, you know, establish basic uh, definitions of, you know, how you, de as I said before, how do you describe a a person, but you might not cover every piece of information that you're going to include about an individual. But you start somewhere, and then the evolution of that specification, if you want to call it, or, or for a standard, will evolve. And the level of sophistication of it's not just about one person, but then the the relationship between one per, you know one individual and another. So your 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 standard or your defi you know specification will will, will grow over time. So my sort of uh, view and my advice is start doing it in, in, you know, so plan for the future, but start doing it in very basic steps until, you, uh, until the industry or the organization gain more maturity as you go forward. Great. 
Thank you, Ty. Time's up there, so can we just thank Nadoon once more? Thank you so much. Um, if you think of any other questions for Nadoon, there'll be a, a short session at the end where you can ask questions of all, all of the speakers. Um, um, <laughs> so so now, now it's my great delight to introduce myself um, to talk to you. Uh, <laughs> Um, as, I mentioned, as I mentioned previously, so I'm talking about some work that I did pre in my previous job when I used to work at the Environment Agency in DEFRA, so I'm flipping my hat into that mode for a bit. Um, and what I want to talk about is around um, carrots and sticks um, and how they apply to sector change. Now, when I put this presentation together, I think I kind of scared some people with the amount of slides I put in for a 10-minute talk. So if it's a bit like a Flickr book, I do apologise, but this is, I, I just thought, a nice way of presenting what I wanted to talk about. Um, so sec sector change in, in DEFRA and DEFRA Group. Um, so DEFRA Group is 30-odd organisations, um, so it's not necessarily a sector in the traditional sense. But in my, in, in my mind, and I think in people who work there's minds, you've got a lot of disparate views of different people, different organisations. It, it operates in the same way as a sector, certainly for the purposes of this. For me, it all started here. Um, I worked at the um, Environment Agency. I ran a team who was responsible for bringing this into the organisation um, by selling data or li selling licences for reuse of data, particularly into the conveyancing market. The business itself, that little business itself, was uh, um, worth about £6 million pounds a year of, of income that was brought in, um, which, is, which is great. And it was money that the Environment Agency could, board could spend pretty much on whatever they wanted. It wasn't ring-fenced to particular policy areas or, or regulatory areas, so they could move it as they wished. Then, in 2013, 2014, you might remember that something like this happened. Well, actually, this happened on the Somerset levels. Um, I absolutely admire this guy for his tenacity in protecting himself. Um, it was the biggest series of floods that, um, and, and storms that had occurred in a period for however many years. That meant this guy, I don't know if you remember this guy, do you remember him? Um, yes, I know you will remember him. Um, putting a lot of pressure onto the Environment Agency's chief executive and getting this out and really starting to beat the organisation into say, and saying, you will release flood data as open data, so therefore remove your charges from flood data because that is in the public interest. Right, so we start talking about sticks. Because of that and that piece, that, that situation that occurred, the ministerial pressure coming onto the organisation and if you ever get to read the minutes of the meeting which I did, it was a very interesting meeting where um, there wasn't a lot of resistance put up to what Francis Maud was suggesting. And this data got released. So this is the uh, Environment Agency's National Flood Risk Assessment. Um, this product is a product that was created by an organisation called Shoot Hill um, that took the data that was released as open data and within two weeks of it being released, put it onto a mapping backdrop that anybody could access, which was a project that the Environment Agency had tried to do for a number of months before that. <laughs> and they managed to turn it around in a couple of weeks, almost immediately showing some of the benefits of actually tricking the data out as open data. Um, this was gratuitous, so I got a trip round the, uh, this is a gratuitous photo, I, took, I got a trip round to the Thames Barrier and I took this picture and I just wanted to say, after that, the floodgates opened. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you know. Um, well, that was the biggest groan in the room, I don't think I'm going to beat that, that's great. Um, and bec because, because of the, the release of the data, the success, effectively the success of the release of that data, the things that started to happen when the flood data started to get reused, it suddenly became easier to start using the carrot within inside the Environment Agency as an organisation in terms of the transition from closed to open data as a whole. Um, the biggest challenge was data that I represent using this. This is, not, this is um, LiDAR point cloud data, um, which, or an image of, I need to be careful about that, it's an image of LiDAR point cloud data, which is... Um, where a plane flies over the, over the ground, fires a laser at the ground, records the height of things, and obviously this is Wembley Stadium represented here. Um, the Environment Agency collects that data for building flood defences. It's very, very accurate. It can be, I think it's up, down to a centimetre resolution in height in, in particular locations. Um, very valuable data set. Cost a lot of money to collect, like lots of money to collect. Um, so they've, they've got aeroplanes, they've got um, the kit itself, they've obviously got uh, people that can fly, can't fly. It, it's quite, quite an expensive process. 
this data was being licensed out for, I think it was about £500,000 a year of income was associated to this, this data set. But because the flood data had been released, we started to talk about this. Um, skipping ahead. So I went and spoke to the Environment Agency board and we were talking there about releasing this data as open data. And the conversation went something like the chief executive saying, well, if we release this data as open data, we don't get any revenue from it. But somebody like the Ordnance Survey, they will take it, incorporate it into their products, then license it on, and they will get money. Why would, you, why would we do that? Back to the carrot. So the, 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 the response to that was me saying, right, OK, so we have however many, 20 odd area offices. In those area offices, there are people who their job is to look at flood risk assessments that are submitted by developers to check that um, people can build in the floodplain or their mitigation is, is accurate. Each one of those spends an eon of time checking the height data that's been used in the flood models that have been submitted. Because this is so expensive for them to use, they use shortcuts to use different data. All of it lower resolution than this. So if we release this as open data, we can then effectively mandate that all of those flood risk assessments are submitted using this data, then we don't have to check it anymore, saving huge amounts of time. Immediately, the mood music in the room changed, and it was like, well, why wouldn't we, we release this as open data if it saves that much time and effort for our staff? Hurrah. Secondary benefits of that, illustrated by this slide, are um, discovery of things that we didn't know. So this was the, the LIDAR, people, people weren't using it, people started to use it, and this is um, um, a picture showing sort of today's roads, so the motorway here shown in the middle, um, but and over on the left-hand side, some of, some of the older features, so Roman roads were rediscovered. There was a guy up, up, um, up north somewhere, I'm not sure exactly where, my memory starts to fade, um, who had, been, had actually spent his working career trying to find a bit of Roman road that linked this bit that you knew about and that bit that you knew about, you couldn't actually piece it. This was, data was released and actually within a few days they'd actually located where that was. So, you know, hurrah. Um, and obviously, the most important benefit was people could take the data and build cities in Minecraft and just import it straight in. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of people who have done this. Slightly jokey, but actually one of the, one of the things that, that, that the sort of knock-on benefits that nobody really imagined was people using the data for building modeling and stuff like that. So I'm gonna crack on. That led to move, moving into DEFRA and looking at DEFRA. Now, this guy, who I used to work with at the Environment Agency, and please pick up his Twitter handle and tweet him, because he doesn't know I've put this in this, this slide deck. <laughs> he starts getting a load of tweets. Um, so he persuaded her, who you might know, um, to say this, just up the road in Shoreditch. Um, nobody in DEFRA knew that she was going to say this, <laughs> apart from those two, pretty much, and the speech writers. Um, I was sitting in the environment agency when this was said, um, and the panic was, well, it wasn't really panic, it was like, well, I wonder how they're going to do that then, before the, dawn, the dawn, dawning, um, actually, it's us that are going to have to do this, oh my God. I moved, moved into DEFRA to sort of lead that project to do that piece of work. Um, that was another stick. Liz Trust got a big stick out and just went, what she did was this. So this is the organization and she just put a load of pressure on the top of it. And it literally, within a matter of weeks, I've got two minutes left apparently, damn. Um, within a matter of weeks, the organization started to um, sort of change and ZAP teams came together across these 30 odd organizations to start to really look at how the data got released. And in the end, we released 10,000 odd open data sets. Okay, hurrah. Um, but we have a brilliant civil service. Why is the civil service in existence? It's there to insulate us from uh, uh, the political changes that we have between governments. So actually, it's really, really good at resisting change. It's really, really good at navigating us through change, which led to, anyone? Um, the status quo being, um, being moved back to, that was the second, that was another good groan. Um, the organization, all the organizations, once the pressure of the stick went, or the, the beating of the stick went, went back to the model that they were working in before and actually the data release was really slow it kind of dried up everyone went back to their little islands working on their own um so what whatever what was this all about why am i talking about this and what what conclusions and things do i want to share so across the organizations 
it, it, usually there's a bunch of people that get it and get what we're trying to do when we're changing the sector. In, in the, the group that I was working with in DEFRA, it was the geeks. So this is illustrative of geeks. So the geeks get it. Quite often, senior management don't. Um, and actually, there's a real trick there for, for building between the, the, between the geeks and the senior management and persuading one or two of these to really understand what the benefits of sharing more data within the sector could do. There's a tightrope to be walked. And that tightrope is one of um, the business model that you've currently got and what you're trying to achieve versus the new business models that could come from releasing more open data. And there's a real tension in there that needs to be navigated. You need one of these. You really do need one of these. Claire's telling me time's up, but I'm hosting, so I can carry on. Um, <laughs> um, and I've only got a few more of these, and I'm hoping for another grow. You need one of these to get people moving. You also need a carrot to actually persuade people to change. You probably need a carrot-shaped stick or a stick-shaped carrot. Um, but it's really important to remember that when you're trying to get organisations and individuals within a sector or within an organisation to change, everybody's different. The messages and the levers that you use will have to be adapted depending on who you're talking to and what's pressurising them and what's pushing them and what they're interested in. And actually it starts with you. Expecting other people to change is one thing, but actually we have to change as well. We change how we approach, we role model things, we start doing things differently and, and actually then change starts to follow that. Bizarrely, I had a, held a session like this with the senior, senior civil servants um, from DEFRA um, in Bristol and walked past an office and this was painted on an office wall that, for, that evening. And I just loved it, so I thought, I will finish on that. You need a carrot and you need a stick. <laughs> Thank you. So I, I suspect as I overran, I probably got time for one or two questions, perhaps. Anyone? Or no questions, even better. You can if you want. <laughs> Did information asset registers of sorts, uh, were they important? Do you think that that's uh, uh, something worth focusing on? So, the two answers to that. So, are they important? Yes. You, you need to know. In this change program, not so much. Um, so, one of, the, one of the things that you quite often hear people say, or quite often hear people say, is that, well, we don't know what we've got, we don't know what quality is, we don't know where it is. And our answer, given the target that we had, is, Good, publish it, it will then get recorded on data.gov.uk and all of a sudden, boom, you've got a, red, a, a record of that particular asset. So we kind of flipped it round and then the organisations, and I'm not sure if this is still true, but the organisations then would use that as part of them understanding what, what assets they had and that then fed some of the metadata systems that they had themselves. I mean, please be kind. No, I... I <laughs> Well, no, I, I just had a, had a small gloss on that, actually. Um, I, at the moment, I, I work uh, for JNCC, uh, the Joint Nature Conservation Committee, which is one of the sort of outposts of DEFRA. We participated in that DEFRA Data 8000. Um, and actually, that, 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 that project, because we had to meet that deadline and so forth and push out a certain amount of data, that actually prompted us to build our own metadata catalogue for the first time and really start mm -hmm. looking at inventorying our, our data. So it did... Yeah, th th there, was that, there was that kind of uh, link there, for us at least. Thank you. I think probably... Oh, go on. One more at the front here. Go on. Um, when working under such pressure and putting so much pressure under a group of people, how do you keep standards high and maintain data standards with, across all sets of data with some resisting staff and some staff that don't actually get what you're trying to do? That's a really good question. Um, so one of the... One of the bingo, the bingo buzzwords is, well, the data is not good enough to share. Well, we're not sharing it, it's not good enough, to which the response is, right, so why have you got it? And they're like, well, we, we make our finance decisions on where we're going to invest. It's like, well, it's good enough for you to make decisions on where you're going to invest stuff, but it's not good enough for you to share with other people. So actually, we didn't really pay much attention to data quality at that point. The, the key bit was pushing the data out and then seeing, sort of kicking off the cycle of understanding what people were going to use the data for and whether it was fit for that purpose. So, 
that was the bulk of the data was in that category. Stuff like flood data, where it's really important that the data is accurate, then the investment was already there from the organization to actually put in place a sort of service wrapper around it to make sure that it was updated and delivered in a structured way. So it kind of depended on the data a bit, but the push for the 8,000 was just get the data out. Definitely times up, oh, sorry, times up, but we, as I say, there's some more time at the very end for further questions. So I'm gonna shut up now and hand over to, uh, to Emma to talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thanks very much. Um, I'm Emma Boggess. I'm the Chief Executive of the Sport and Recreation Alliance, which is an umbrella body representing national governing bodies of sport and other sports organisations. Uh, and I'm delighted to come here to talk a little bit about um, Open Active, which is a programme uh, that I've been involved in and sit on an advisory group for. Uh, unlike... Um, uh, Mike, I'm going to have no slides, so uh, you'll get a complete contrast and just say a few words about both the, what I've described as the, oh, I've got one slide, which says me, there we go. <laughs> um, and um, uh, I'm going to talk about what I've described as the what, the why and the how of open data. So what is it? Why are we doing it? And how are we doing it? Uh, sorry, of open active. And, and then I'm going to finish by just maybe highlighting some of the challenges and some of the issues that we're having to face in terms of implementing uh, the, the programme. So firstly, starting with the what. Well, what is open uh, active all about? It's about getting, sharing data, uh, using data to help get people more active. Um, when Sport England, who are the arm's length body that give out both Exchequer and National Lottery money to invest in grassroots sport, published their new strategy in May 2016, they included a statement which says we want to make it as easy to book a badminton court as it is a, uh, a restaurant. Um, at the moment, if I asked anybody here how, how you would book a restaurant for tonight or any date in the future, I suspect many of you would pull out your phone, you would go to Open Table or Book a Table, or there are the other apps out there, uh, but something like that. Um, and within, within seconds, you could be booking a restaurant literally probably in any, anywhere in the world for any time in the future. Uh, if I also said to you, could you now book a badminton court to play at uh, 7 o'clock this evening in Birmingham, many of you probably wouldn't even know where to start. And even if you Googled it, you wouldn't actually find it a very easy thing to do. Um, so the, really, the summary is what we're trying to do through um, Open Active is make it as easy uh, to do that, um, whether, whether, whether you want to think about location, whether you want to think about a specific or particular activity, whether you want to think about the time or place that you want to do it. We want to make it as possible. At the moment, it does exist in some parts, so you might be able to do something about a particular sport. You might be able to find go on to something that shows you where all the swimming pools in this country are and allows you to, to know at least where they are. But you, there isn't a seamless way to be doing it, thinking about a variety of different activities and certainly nothing that will allow you to do um, the kind of end to end process that is the equivalent of, of booking a restaurant table. Um, but, but it's important, I guess, to say that Open Active is not about creating an app. It's about creating the environment uh, where um, developers can be creative, can be inventive, do what they do best and use the data uh, to make it more accessible to people. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, why are we trying to do it? Well, at the moment, um, around 40% of the UK population don't meet the Chief Medical Officer's guidance for being active. Um, you might say, well, what are the Chief Medical Officer's guidance for being active? Many people maybe don't know it, um, but it's about doing more than 150 minutes of moderate activity in a week. Uh, and at the moment, around 25% of the population do less than 30 minutes a week and around another 15% do between 30 and 150 minutes a week. Um, but at the same time, we also know lots of evidence about the benefits of being active, whether that's about the physical benefits, whether it's about the benefits to mental well-being, whether it's about the kind of community and social engagement it can cause and create, or whether it's about your own individual development. There are lots of benefits, and unsurprisingly, to address lots of wider public policy issues, uh, government is very keen to get more people active and get more people at least meeting the CMO's guidelines. So we want to be able to remove the barriers to why people aren't active, and some of the barriers are highlighted as well I don't know where to go I don't know how to do it I don't know how to make the step particularly for those people who are inactive at the moment to make the first step into being more active so that's the why that's the motivation for why uh, Sport England are investing in this program and it very much more supports a, a government drive to getting more people physically active 
So the how, uh, how we're doing it is, is through a, a multi-year programme called Open Active, which is aiming to support organisations who have data about uh, opportunities, opportunity data we call it, places, things that you can do, places that you can do it, about sharing that data. And at the moment, the programme is working with individual organisations, so that might be a national governing body, like some of the members of my organisation. It might be a leisure trust. It might be somebody who manages uh, many leisure trusts around the country who have got data, have got information about activities, where they're taking place, how much they cost, what time they're run, what level of activity they are, etc., and sharing it. And as you would expect from an ODI-led project, there's a standards group, um, comes back to some of the comments we were talking about, about identifying exactly what data are we talking about here, uh, and being very clear about the different types of information that you need to give people if you want to be able to do that sort of journey from finding something and then being able to potentially book it and actually get on and do it. Uh, and recently it's been particularly looking at booking spec, um, about how to manage reservations, uh, and about also issues around accessibility. There's also an awareness campaign uh, to the sector about the benefits of why they should do it, encouraging more and more organisations to do it. Uh, and the programme's also included running, running an accelerator with a number of startups who are actually starting to use the first bits of open data in this area and thinking about creative. And I think later on there's an opportunity to see at least one of those uh, in action. And at the moment we're in the final month of that accelerator programme and the focus on being, has been connecting on connecting the startups with mentors, potential investors, and helping to get pilots underway. So I'm going to finish by just saying a little bit about some of the challenges. I'm going to highlight four, and some of them come up the topics that you've heard already this afternoon. The first one is around GDPR. So the Open Active project has been going for a couple of years now, but it was, I suppose, really late last year, start, early start of this year, where there's a, a lot of emphasis about raising awareness within the sector, getting organisations to think about it. And although it's nothing to do with sharing personal data, if you are a small uh, national governing body of sport, you, in some cases you may have a few paid staff, you may have no paid staff. Uh, actually, your level of understanding and expertise around data probably at the moment is quite low. So on the one hand, people are being bombarded with messages about do not share personal data, make sure you're going to be GDPR compliant. And the next thing, they're being told, open up your data, give it to anybody. And uh, I'm sure many people in the room will say, well, that's, those, those two things were completely different. But if you're a lay person, you would understand that actually at the time it was quite challenging to organisations on the one hand to be thinking about protecting their data, on the other hand to be thinking about sharing it. And therefore being very clear about what we were and weren't sharing was really an important issue. There was also a bit of scepticism about previous activity in this area. So a number of years ago, there was a programme called SPOGO, which I think was, spent, was supposed to be short for Sport on the Go. Uh, and that was when um, basically the sort, sort of, this sort of thing, but it wasn't, it wasn't really about opening data. It was actually about creating a single point, creating an activity finder where people could go and find out lots of uh, opportunities to be active. So it wasn't about creating the environment, it was actually almost creating the end product. And because the product, end product was being created by frankly somebody, an organisation that didn't really understand how to do data that well at that point, um, there was a, it didn't really go anywhere. So lots of organisations invested heavily in the concept of SPOGO and then it kind of fizzled out. So then when they were told, oh, now what you need to be getting behind now is open active and you need to be giving all your data here, there was perhaps understandably a little bit of reticence to think, well, is this going to go the same way as Spogo? What's different about it? Why should we be prepared to invest in it this time where before perhaps it was, it was challenging? Um, the third area I think has been a bit of a concern is that generally um, investment in sport and physical activity, uh, as in lots of investment in public uh, sector areas, is going down. So lots of sports organisations which have been in receipt of public money have been increasingly encouraged to become more commercial. And one of the ways they've been doing that is by using their data uh, and using it to generate some revenue. Um, so it comes back to one of the points we heard earlier on that uh, then what we're saying to them is actually stop using this data to generate commercial income, start making it freely available and actually getting them to understand that maybe doing that in the way that you might talked about, well, on one hand we seem to be losing something but actually understanding the real value and the gain you're going to get from it. So convincing people of that logic and that's still very much a kind of work in progress. 
And the last one I would highlight, I think, is completing priorities. It comes back to my point about many of these organisations, particularly in our membership, are quite small organisations, haven't got very much resource. And getting uh, CEOs engaged, so in fact, just only a couple of weeks ago, Richard Norris, uh, who works on the programme here at ODI, was in talking with chief execs of national governing bodies exactly to get them to do what Mike was describing there, finding one or two champions at CEO level who can really drive it in an organisation, get them to buy into it and be instilling in their teams why this is important. But there are lots, I think, as, as he heard on the day, it's very easy to say make this a strategic priority, but organisations are being told to make lots of things strategic priorities. So that's a challenge. But in summary, there are now 93 committed organisations, 26 organisations who are sharing their data, uh, just over 145,000 activities or opportunities uh, published every month, 216 people trained in data skills and 83 people contributing to the data standards. So there is a community building, there is some momentum behind this. I think the government at the moment probably think it's a bit slower than they'd like, they'd like a bit more progress, they'd like more data out there. Um, but it's definitely a progress, um, it's definitely made progress over the last couple of years and continues to grow. Um, and I'm very happy now to take any questions. Any questions? Hi, uh, my name's Hamil from a company called MyEd. We work with education data to help parents, students um, find a place to learn. And one thing we do is get parents into school and then there's no reason for them to come back to us until their kid needs to go to college or university. So one of the things that we're working on is how do we access information to help parents find activity clubs because that's the big thing once your kid is in school. And that ranges from sports to languages to arts to poetry to music. Um, how could a company like us, working with Birmingham City Council to try and make this a reality, learn from some of the best practices that you have learnt from uh, with the funding you have and the funding we don't, um, so that we could speed up this process and produce more open data to produce more open innovation. Um, so you mean in terms of in other sectors, not just in, around yeah, so sport and others? Going back to what Nadine was saying, borrowing from other yeah, industries yeah. and learning from them instead of trying to reinvent the wheel uh, and making this process a lot quicker and a lot more efficient and smarter yeah. than uh, a small team. Uh, let's engage with somebody like you that's doing this, but yeah. we want to do it on a broader scale in other other areas for kids. Yeah. Well, I mean, a couple of things. I think one, I would say, um, I'm sure uh, the Open Active team would be happy to talk about some of the learning. So Richard, who I mentioned earlier, is in the corner over there, I'm sure uh, works here at the ODI, would be happy to, to talk about some of that. I think... A couple of things though, where there, I think there are some links in that though, because one of the things I talked about was one of the reasons we want people to be active is around um, individual learning and develop. So one of the things we we know is that kids who are more active learn better, engage better, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and because this is being driven by Sport England through the Department for Culture, Media and Sport, I think there's, a, there's quite a strong link there in terms of what do we, a variety of things. So yes, we champion the benefits of sport and physical activity, but there would be equally people championing the, the arts and culture and media. So hopefully already in, in that d department, you've got people, you've got, you've got a kind of interest area in terms of people who are interested in, the, in a similar area of interest. Um, and I think, the sports minister, who is also the minister for civil society more widely, is very engaged in this area. So perhaps there's an opportunity to think about engaging DCMS about how they can spread learning. So actually, what are the arts doing about this? What's, what's media, what's music doing about it? But I think probably in the first instance, it's talking to Richard to follow up. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. So in this sector, um, if it's changing the, the kind of biz business model for, for the leisure trusts, what do you think that would be changing from and to? Because unless they're in the same sort of part of the country, they might have different people coming in and maybe the, I just w wonder what the sort of rationale is when you're presenting to them about why well, to Encouraging them to yeah. do it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's more, it's all about getting more people doing it. So if, if people, one of the, one of the barriers that people identify about why they are not why they are not active is because they don't know how to do it or they don't understand or they don't can't get information and access to it so when we're trying to persuade the example for the example with governing bodies who might at the moment essentially sell that data to people and you're trying to convince them well why should i now make that available freely and therefore lose the income stream the 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 
quid pro quo is that more people will be doing your activity and therefore you can generate more from maybe they will then become a member of your organisation or they will take part in your competitions or they will uh, learn, get qualifications. So essentially you're replacing one revenue stream with another. Uh, and also because the way that government supports, uh, particularly national governing bodies, is about encouraging more people to be active and they are rewarded, not just, I don't mean they're just simply rewarded by, by, for numbers, uh, but actually getting more people doing your activity is, seen, is a good thing. So you have to kind of give up the short term, you're getting some money in for the long term, which is more people and more sustainable sport and more sustainable activity. And that's the kind of business case we're presenting. Thank you. We've probably got time for one more. Is there anybody at the back that I can't see because of that light? Or that's, uh, anything? No, good. Uh, okay. Thank you very much, Emma. Thank you. There we go. So, hi. What have I done? You might be needing to to press out. a few buttons. There we go. Press a few buttons. Maybe. There we go. Uh, so that's me. Hi, I'm from Ofgem, which is the independent energy regulator in Great Britain. Um, thanks to ODI for opportunity to come and speak to you today. I'm here with a particular hat on. So, within Ofgem, I own the My Data in Energy project. Uh, I'm very pleased to be working with the ODI, ODI on that challenge of how we start opening up access to data in the energy sector. Now, I think from looking quickly at who's, who's in the room, very, very few people from the energy sector, which is quite refreshing because that tends to be the sort of events I go to. Um, I think just perhaps a little bit of context on energy before we get into some of the more data specific bits. So as a sector, energy is really on the cusp of a, a fundamental transformation and that's driven by a number of factors. Uh, one is about new data coming online, particularly coming from things like smart meters, but also all kind of sensors around the system about what's happening uh, out there on the networks and things like that. Secondly, we've got a lot of new technology coming along, things like storage, electric vehicles, new ways of generating, uh, automating the home, all those kind of things. Um, and taken together, that's really leading the development of new, new markets, new ways of transacting around energy, be it in, in local energy or peer-to-peer -peer trading and all sorts of things. And there's a really massive prize there in terms of the innovation that, that those developments can drive, um, partly in terms of driving down the cost of the en energy system as a whole and that feeding through to customers' bills, uh, customers being you. Um, similarly supporting the decarbonisation of the energy sector um, and also improving the security of supply as well given the challenges for the system of having more renewable generation on and being able to be more flexible around that. So it's a bit of, bit of the context. Um, that in itself is challenging the way in which we set up and, and run the, the energy market. So we ran a, a call for evidence earlier in the year asking about barriers to innovation, in the, particularly in the retail energy market. And it perhaps wasn't surprising when the num number one issue that came back was around access to data. A lot of other issues as well around complexity of regulation and things like that, but data came through really, really strongly uh, as, a, as a barrier in that sort of space. Similarly, we've heard about GDPR. Obviously, that's come in this year. That gives customers rights towards their data in energy. That's, there's no real practical way for people to get hold of their data. I think you can go to your supplier and ask for it, and they might send you a memory stick or something like that, um, not necessarily in any particular format. So uh, there's also a challenge there in terms of how we... Um, really bring to life some of those those rights for consumers in terms of their, their data. Um, so I think you know, more broadly we see that data access and portability and the quality of that data is really a key driver of the sort of innovation that we, we want and need to see in, in energy. Um, and that's been very much the, the aim of the government's My Data initiative. You may be familiar with it. I think it's been around for 
quite a long time. Uh, it's gone through a number of iterations in that time, so uh, things like quick read codes, um, something the government mandated for, for energy suppliers a number of years ago. Um, but in its modern iteration is now uh, very much similar in concept to open banking, so I know some of you will be uh, very familiar with that. Um, so, here we go, we'll give her a slide. Uh, what we've done is set up a, a cross-governmental project, a uh, number of different bits of, of government that we're working with, and Ofgem's leading that project to really bring this thing that we've talked about for quite a long time to, to fruition. And what my data is really about uh, is enabling where a consumer wants to share their, their data with, with a third party, uh, a way for that to happen in an automated and instantaneous way by their supplier that holds that data to that, to that third party, obviously uh, with the appropriate consent and verification of the, the customer there. Um, in its initial form, the, the, the sort of primary use case is very much around helping people to uh, compare tariffs and, and switch supplier. Um, and uh, whilst that's not necessarily particularly useful, oh, sorry, useful, interesting, it is useful, um, exciting in terms of novelty, we, we've had price comparison websites for a long time, um, you just need to go and talk to some of them and understand a little bit about the consumer journey that, um, that users go on, particularly when they go to their websites, and it's fascinating to see graphs of, of where people drop out of the process. And they kind of, you know, put your name in, fine, people can manage that. Who are you with? Ooh, you know, people aren't necessarily so sure. And it gets through to things like, how much do you consume a year? And suddenly, you know, massive dropouts, because you know, people don't know, or they don't know where their bills are, all those sort of things. And the potential for that data, just you know, tick a box, boom, that's instantaneously in there. Um, hopefully is, uh, helps empower people to engage, um, make, make better informed decisions about their uh, energy supply, save money, which is always nice. Um, we know we've got a relatively long-standing issue around competition in the energy sector, particularly with consumers who, for whatever reason, don't engage, getting, getting worse deals. So this is a way of um, helping more people to engage and helping that drive competition. And then perhaps more exciting uh, looking ahead is the way in which this data could be linked with other data sets. Um, for example, people's granular consumption data coming out of smart metering or different bits of uh, data about what's happening on the, the local networks or things like that to develop new services um, that could really add value. So as I say, we're, we're leading this cross-government project team uh, and trying to utilize the expertise of uh, various uh, other organizations like the Energy System Catapult, Alan Turing, and of course, Open Data Institute. Now, we are uh, trying to deliver this through a really open policy-making approach, so being completely transparent about the development process, We're really keen that this isn't just something we go away in a room and, and design a new data standard and sort of unveil that on the market. Uh, not least, it's not off Jim's expertise by any stretch, uh, to do that, I think it's really important that whatever standard is developed is something that works for, for the industry it's going into, uh, works for, for consumers um, more broadly. So being as open and transparent about that process as possible, in line with uh, ODI guidance, uh, following that very closely. Um, and we're pleased you know, the amount of interest we've had from stakeholders in this space. Um, I think over 250 stakeholders signed up to uh, see the materials that are being produced. I think we've got about 100 of those who regularly involved in a number of working groups that we've got set up to help inform development of that standard and actually do some of that standard writing itself. In some ways, that's not enough. And one of the challenges is trying to find uh, you know, a wider range of stakeholders, particularly people who might actually be using this data, not just some of the usual suspects um, from within the industry itself. No offense to anyone who's here already from that. Um, and as a result, in fact, it was quite timely. Yesterday, we produced our first initial straw man design of the of the my data of, of uh, for the my data standard. Uh, again, based on that, the work of those industry working groups, um, and I'll show you where you can find that later. Um, I was slightly horrified when I asked the team to put together a slideshow, and they put that in there. Do not attempt to look at it. All I would say is, we have a plan. That's good. We we are moving into uh, the standards development phase, which is much more exciting bit, which is really good, and uh, our aim is to implement this by in, in less than 12 months from now. So it's something that is 
uh, uh, hopefully going to come to fruition reasonably soon. I think, given how long my data has been going on as a concept, a fair degree of scepticism about that. Um, but I think there's a real uh, energy behind getting, sorry, excuse the pun, um, uh, energy behind getting this this done and quickly. So to finish, I've had my yellow card. Um, we are we have got these three industry groups set up. Obviously, the, the key one there around the standards design authority, the people who are going to actually hold the pen in writing this new new data standard for the, the various data fields that we're we're looking at. Um, really important a user engagement forum, understanding the the use cases and making sure that the consumer experience is really put at the heart of uh, of this standard. Um, and finally, a, an industry development group. So thinking through, um, particularly for the, the companies that are going to be required um, to, to open up their data, um, that that's something that actually works and think about some of the important mechanisms around how you uh, verify that a customer has given consent and um, you know, how beyond the first iteration that we mandate out there, the industry can update and evolve that because we think you know, what we put out in the first instance is relatively narrow in terms of the data fields and the, the use cases, but all sorts of potential. We want to make sure that there's a mechanism there for that to happen um, really, really smoothly going forwards. So I'll stop there. I think just you know, really keen to get people involved. We're particularly keen to understand experiences from other sectors, be it banking or elsewhere, make sure we can learn the lessons from that. Um, I'm really happy to answer any questions. Thank you. So, oh. You can. <laughs> Are there any questions for me? Hi, my name is Paul Clark. I'm from the Higher Education and Statistics Agency. Um, you're, you're a regulator, mm -hmm. uh, and you collect data for regulatory purposes. Mm -hmm. Presumably, is, was there any, did you face any issues around repurposing that data? Um, uh, and, you know, for, for innovation, even if it's a kind of public good, public interest mm -hmm. issues, and, and, and if so, how did you overcome those? So in this case, we're not talking about data that the regulator holds. None of this data comes through us. This is about data your your supplier, everyone's suppliers hold about them, and it, the ob we're committed to using our powers to put obligations on the energy companies to open up that, particularly where you you want you authorize a, a third party to to do that. Um, I think there are other issues about various data sets we do hold, and then we've got a big. I don't think we've had a minister come and sort of threaten us with putting out 8,000 data sets, but we have got a big data services team that we've set up to try and think what we can do. We, we do publish quite a lot of data at the moment, but I think there's an awful lot more that we could do in that space. Um, that yeah, requires a little bit of thought about what's, uh, what's appropriate, but I think, again, we're trying to change that mindset a little bit from yeah, we keep it to what, uh, you know, why wouldn't we put that out there? I work for Alexon, which is in the energy industry. So a lot of the data formats in the energy industry at the moment are quite archaic, mm -hmm. and they cost a lot of money to access and use, which can be a barrier to entry for mm -hmm. new suppliers. Um, where do you see the sort of the standard of that data that's already transferred within the industry going? Mm -hmm. So I think it's one of, the, one of the challenges with what we're doing is quite a lot of the data a lot of data is held with suppliers, but there are obviously various central industry bodies like yourselves and others that have a lot of data as well. And I understand quite a few of those are considering how to open up access to that data more broadly. But we do have yeah, quite a lot of uh, different data sets out there. And it's going to be a challenge to make sure that what, what we're doing in this space uh, is capable of being joined up and integrated. I mean, perhaps you're also alluding to the fact that the quality of data in the energy sector is also pretty shocking. This my data in itself isn't going to directly affect that. We're not sort of putting obligations on companies to go out there and cleanse stuff. But I think just the general sense that actually making it available will increase the incentives on companies to make sure that that data is available. Clearly, if, if someone, a customer asks you to share their data and half the data fields are empty, that's going to prompt you as a company to think, actually, I'd better be going around trying to fulfill those. Um, I think there is a broader question. I think there's a lot of different ways consumers can get data in the energy sector. Smart metering will you know, have one particular way for doing that. Customers can have their own um, access devices in the home that feed off the smart meter and, and can get the data out. Obviously, you can get data through your supplier. So we're going to be thinking about that ecosystem and how those things fit together so we don't end up duplicating in that space. Um, but 
Hi. Uh, just referring to the education sector at the moment, uh, we're trying to collect information from schools and there's no compliancy. So there's an issue of how do you collect consistent data from schools that are really important for uh, parents to make better informed decisions. I was just wondering if in your experience of doing this, did you have to change policy and compliancy for the energy providers to make sure that you got a consistent run of data to be able to make uh, you know, spot trends and be able to kind of innovate for uh, really for the people mm -hmm. so that they got the information that is needed for more efficient energy practices. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you could comment on how compliancy yeah. and working with well, those energy practices. Well, um, I mean, the good thing about being a regulator is we've got quite strong powers. So I said we originally, government was going to do this using using legislation, I think, for various reasons. Parliament's a little bit busy for the next couple of years, so hence why we've stepped in, because we think this is a really good thing, and we've got the, the power to oblige companies. I think as part of developing the, the standard and the framework, we'll, we'll need to think about what that compliance regime looks like. As it is, you know, we'll put an obligation on companies, they need to do it. If they don't, we've got very strong powers to find within that. Obviously, experience of some previous iterations, things like quick read codes, so suppliers are obliged to put quick read codes on your bills. Various businesses have sort of used that, um, people scanning those in to help inform suppliers. Quite a few issues in the early days, just about, it only takes one little glitch in that code and it's pretty useless. Um, so it's a slightly different challenge for us to enforce compliance with you know, pretty technical stuff as opposed to what we're doing more generally, which is around, is your company treating you fairly? Um, you know, have they missold to you? Some of those different things. So I think we will require a little bit of thought about how we make sure that that granular data that's being, um, needs to be shared is, is of the right sort of quality. As we say, we're not going to wait until all data in the, the system is perfect because we didn't ever end up doing it. Um, but yeah, that's where a, a nice stick Carrot shaped stick, but a nice big stick helps. So here we go. Yeah. yeah. Let's see. Right. Okay. Oh. Sorry. Cool. Thank you. Can we um, thank you? So I got told off for not using a microphone because I'm not mic'd up anymore. Right. So um, time for our final speaker. Um, it's getting warm in the room. There are beers outside soon. So um, let's. Keep, keep our attention for the next sort of 10 or 15 minutes um, and I'll hand over to Nina. Okay. All right, I will try and um, get through this as painlessly as possible so everyone can enjoy a drink. Um, all right, so I'm going to go ahead and talk you through the story of Bud um, and you're probably thinking, I thought we were talking about open banking. I promise you though, the story of Bud is also the story of open banking. Um, so here we go. Our mission. Um, what we do is bu at BUD and what we think of ourselves as is the financial network. And ultimately what we want to do is make sure that every person has a healthier relationship with their finances. Um, I am a millennial. I have a terrible relationship with my finance. And we were kind of founded on the idea of no one really knows what they're doing with their money. Um, that being said, what is BUD? So we are a fintech. As you can tell, I don't work for a bank. I work for a fintech. Um, I could not get away with this at a bank. But um, we license our platform, our technology platform, to various financial institutions, mainly banks. And what we have is a layer that sits in between the bank and a host of third-party providers underneath. So. This is my favorite little illustration of what it is that we're doing. We're kind of building a sandwich there, bringing together all this data, financial data, to ultimately help each customer better understand their financial lives. That is built on three key pillars. So the first thing is account aggregation. Um, actually, maybe I'll stop for a second. How many of you have heard of open banking? Can I quick show of hands? Yeah, somewhere. Hopefully not the Daily Mail, um, preferably in the Telegraph or City AM. Okay, so we've got a fairly informed audience. Um, so account aggregation. So this year, January 13, 2018, it was mandated that the CMA9 would have to release open banking APIs, which basically just means that you should be able to see all of your transactional history 
in any other third party if you grant that access. So GDPR, PSD2, perfect storm meeting. Um, so what we did was bring together all of the CMA9 open banking APIs, and where they were available, we screen scrape. Um, but what that means ultimately is now you suddenly see your entire financial life in one place. So if we think about the number of bank accounts that we have, the accounts that we log into, I mean, I'm American, um, so I've got a few bank accounts back home, I've got a few credit cards, I've got a bank, two bank accounts here, a credit card here, a French bank account, an Austrian bank account, um, and I'm sure many of you as well, you have your current account, you have your joint account, you have another account, a secret account, <laughs> maybe. Um, <laughs> who knows? No judgment. Um, you've got your mortgage, your savings, an investment account, your pensions. It just keeps adding up and adding up. And by the end of it, you realize you've been logging in to 20 different places to figure out how much money do I have today. So what we did is we thought, bring it all together so it sits under one roof. And all of a sudden, you're like, wow. This is how much money I actually have. Amazing. So as you can see on that far left, we've got an American Express, um, black American Express, because I'm just rolling in money, um, NatWest, Barclays, um, and then we've even got Wealthify, which is um, a robo-advisor. And so we've got an ISA there, um, and you can add anyone under the sun. The second pillar is insights. So this is where the data kicks in. We've pulled together all these accounts. We have all this transactional data. And what does that mean ultimately? We have a 360 degree view of every single customer that we are working with. And now we're able to trend and anonymize, GDPR compliant, all of the data that we're receiving. And so much in the way of Spotify or Netflix, where Spotify goes, OK, you just keep listening to Justin Bieber. You must like Justin Bieber. We're going to present you with other things. I don't actually know what is similar to Justin Bieber anymore. Um, Different example, you love the Beatles, so we're going to present something else that's like the Beatles. Netflix, we're all binge watching these shows. You really like true crime. We're going to present you with more true crime documentaries, whatever. Similarly, we are creating a persona about each customer. People like you like products like this. People in your income bracket, people in your postcode are like this, using products like this. So what we've done is we've created a number of data enrichment suites which help us get a better idea of just what you're spending, where you're spending, how often you're spending, um, how much is incoming, how much is outgoing. It's a little bit creepy actually, but we actually learn a lot about each customer, which leads us to the marketplace. So we have about 80 partners which range from insurance to mortgages, savings, pensions, utilities, um, credit cards, loans, anything under the financial sun which means that in due course, we can recommend the right product or service at the right time that is most relevant to you. Um, I had this example a few weeks ago, wanted to apply for a loan. Went to Zopa, um, which is a peer-to-peer -peer lending service. And it, it could be that my credit score was awful, but um, it turns out I don't have enough history, living history in the US, or sorry, in the UK, for the past three years, and so I was automatically declined. That's really frustrating, and you're filling out just pages, and, I mean, it's that long, that form. You're just filling out pages and pages of forms only to get rejected. That wasn't relevant to me, and quite frankly, it was really frustrating. So if we could strip that away and only serve things that you might very likely be accepted for, then that makes things better for you. So how do we do it? APIs, Application Programming Interfaces. So these are kind of what we think of as the glue and the future of financial services, really. Um, what we've done here, Wealthify, also another investment fund or investment product, um, which is partially owned by Aviva. They were our first API integration. And so what we did is we integrated them into Bud. And so if you had an account with Wealthify, you could suddenly see the value of your ISA right there in your app. And we actually saw that there was an uptick in the amount of engagement we got within the app that was live. So that's all well and good. We're looking at investment. But what else is there? Bill management. Everyone is paying bills to hopefully everyone is. I certainly am. Um, there's one of our partners named OneDocs. What they do is they pull together all of your household bills. So now we can see your Netflix account. Um, we can see your telecommunications, we can see your water. 
DVLA, is that it? It's DMV in the States, sorry. Um, your Spotify, your utilities bill. And what that means is we get even more data, which means that we're able to put it to use for you. So this is one of my favorite examples, and it really ties into what Neil was speaking about earlier in terms of energy and switching and how switching is a little bit boring. But the thing about switching is not many people know that they can do it. Um, I certainly didn't. So there are a ton of kind of new businesses cropping up like Flipper who switch your utilities for you. But could you imagine if we spot your utilities bill coming in each month and we go, can you just confirm that this is your utility bill? Yes. And we go, okay, based on your postcode, you are paying 30% more than everyone else. Would you like to switch your utilities? Great, okay, that sounds amazing. So we introduce you with, to Flipper. Flipper switches your utilities for you. Um, we go, we have your name, address, your postcode. So we've actually shortened the entire process down to a few screens. So all you need to confirm is the number of bedrooms that you have in your, your flat or your home. And all of a sudden, we can present you with this. You can have your utility switch. But that's not where it ends, actually. We can move even further and say, you've saved 300 pounds a year on your utilities. Do you want to open an investment account with one of our partners? And all of a sudden, we have this life experience going on. So it's not just about financial services. It's about your life. Um, I don't have any screens for it, but um, recently there was a bill introduced uh, called the Credit Worthiness Bill by Lord Bird. And that's something that we've been working on with HM Treasury um, for the Rental Recognition Challenge. So much like here, we are identifying your utility bills. We can identify your rent. And then we can work with credit scoring agencies and say, this person is paying their rent every single month but they're not receiving anything for it. You're just, you know, it's going away and nothing happens. What if you could use your rental payments to build your credit history? You now have a paper trail. I am a credit worthy person. I'm paying my rent every month. Then we can conceivably say, okay, you've got this 300 pounds that you've saved. Why don't you put it into a savings account or an investment account? We can start building you towards building up that down payment. So you've got both things going up at one time. You've got the investment, or savings for that down payment, and you also are building your credit history. All of those things converge, and we are able to build a lifelong journey to help someone purchase a house at the end of the day. So what we're doing at Bud is not so much distributing financial services. Distributing financial services, we can get anywhere, right? There's plenty of price comparison websites. What we really are about at Bud is creating life journeys, because no one really wants to be fiddling around looking at their finances, how much I have incoming or outgoing, can I make it through the month, whatever. What they want to do is own a home. They want to get married, they want to retire. So how can we help them do that? Unleashing all of this data that we now have. Um, speaking to Mike's point earlier about the carrot and the stick. So we kind of had a little bit of both. Um, just as he said, you need carrot sticks. Um, PSD2 was the legislation that was brought forward in the European Commission, and that mandated that we need to open up this data. Um, that is enforced here with the CMA9, with the CMA. Um, but we needed that initial kind of stick to say, you're doing this now. Um, what would be really interesting to see for me personally is in the future, in other markets, in the US and Australia, whether they will be mandated to do it or if they'll do it on their own. Um, they're on their journey, just like much of us, most of us here in this room are. So um, in a nutshell, that's Bud, and that's what we're doing to revolutionize the banking. Oh, oh. questions? I don't bite. Michael Spry, I've just uh, completed a, a project in open banking, so I know a little bit about open banking. Excellent. And, and, and the CMA 9 through PSD2 have mandated um, standard data formats, so that's why you can use APIs. But a, a lot of what you've shown on the screen here, sort of uh, utility companies, etc., cetera, don't, don't have the same stick to uh, provide APIs. So you're having to use screen scraping, I, I assume. So a lot of it, you're correct, is screen scraping. Um, we see kind of a movement now. I mean, just being here in this room is testament to that, where 
the more we open up, the more we see in different verticals, people are becoming very interested in the idea of opening up data. So, I mean, pensions, for example, that's probably what many would consider the slowest moving, quite literally. Um, but I was at an event and um, DWP were there and they were saying, this is really an interesting idea. We'd like to explore that topic with you. We see it with mortgages and now with savings accounts. So slowly, you know, we are scraping where necessary, but we're getting to a, po a kind of tipping point now where people are realizing, actually, this can be really beneficial for all of us involved in this financial system. Does that make sense? Do, do you see that legislation is necessary in order to uh, give, the, give the impetus to uh, pr provide APIs? I think, a personal opinion, um, in financial services, it's a highly regulated industry. So in that case, it was necessary to have that quite large stick coming down with PSD2. With um, other verticals, that might not be the case. Um, in other industries, it might not be the case. Um, but for us, I think it was necessary, but everyone else is kind of getting on board now. Um, yeah, that's the short answer. We can, we can have a <laughs> chat over it later. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, there. Just a lady here. Hello. Just uh, wondered if you'd thought of um, working with any organizations running uh, universal basic income trials, for example, in Scotland. That would be really interesting. Yeah, um, that actually would be very interesting. Um, I was at an event yesterday and I met a woman that is working on financial inclusion, so it's definitely something that we are exploring. Um, right now, I mean, what we're doing with the Rental Recognition Challenge is kind of, that's the first step. Um, but I think as we grow as a business, we are a startup, so we're about 50. Um, but as we grow, our hope is to be able to actually kind of spread our tentacles and get into financially including everybody and financial literacy. Moreover, one more. This way. Thank you. Sean McGuire from Legend Club Management Systems. We're a software vendor and uh, very pleased to be working on the Open Active project, mm. actually. However, um, uh, during the course of today, there were quite a few references to, in the context of open data, what I like to think of as three separate things the open data, the static data that doesn't include personal information, mm -hmm. then personal information, and then to a certain extent open systems. And there's a blurry line in the open data reference within that. But your business, Bud, is enormously inspirational and our sector has yet to experience such a, a business and we're hopeful that open data will result in such a thing. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, the business model is very dependent upon uh, legislation and in particular what's going to happen with privacy yes. and the likes of what's happening with Facebook uh, and others will have a bearing on your business mm -hmm. so it's interesting to me to consider that and to think about what in particular might be of concern for you because you're clearly uh, an inherent part of your business model is to take information from the different systems that is actually personal information and a lot of these apps in the fine print, deep, deep down in the apps, mm -hmm. often impossible to retrieve or impossible to not use the app without, mm -hmm. have this uh, implicit, I've opted in to sharing my data. The caveat, What yeah. if that was changed? So uh, you're completely right. Privacy, is, especially when it comes to your financial life, is uh, paramount. And for us, actually, I mean, within our business, we've been working with the regulators since day one. And, you know, besides a deluge of, of emails, May 20th for GDPR, you know, do you opt in or out? We, we kind of saw it as a blessing, actually, um, because there's multiple things involved, um, but most importantly, consent. And yes, there is kind of, we could just slide it there and kind of say, oh, don't look at this, you know. We're going to go and sell all your data somewhere. Um, but interestingly enough, with regulation, there are mandated now um, bits where the actual user interface, the user experience, has to involve roadblocks of consent. 
Um, and as I said, we, we've been working with the regulator. We've been in the FCA sandbox twice now. It's something that we are very, very careful of and moving forward, um, highly aware of what's going on with Facebook and especially Facebook, but anyone else, um, there is you know, that responsibility to make sure that we keep everything secure. We are GDPR compliant, but also the way that um, our chief information infrastructure and security officer has set everything up is part of how we went about doing that. And that's actually part of the reason why banks will work with us, because for us, the security and the privacy is of the utmost importance. Great. Thank you. So can we just thank Nina once more? Yeah. Yeah. So we're running towards the end. Um, so what I wanted to do now is just give an opportunity. For, if there's any other questions that you've thought about for any of the panellists, if you want to ask them now, we might do a rogues gallery standing up at the front. We might just stand up. We'll see who the question's for. Um, so we're just going to do this for a couple of minutes. So is, is there any sort of final questions that you want to ask? Yes. If you can say who it's for as well, we might then jump up. But we do need to do a bit of microphone dancing. For the same, for, for the whole, for the whole group, it's kind of budding on the previous question. Beyond mandating and legislation, how do we reassure the general public that when they share data with a specific organisation, that and it, and if that data is going to be shared, how that it's not being used or misused? More importantly, is a real there's a real question around public trust, and people nowadays just click everything. So yes, 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 it's fine. But, how, but it takes one scandal too many one, to really kind of break down that system of trust that kind of will undermine the whole sector. Um, how do we maintain a sort of level of public trust beyond legislation and kind of uh, to, to make sure that kind of the, the debate is not around misuse of data, but rather the benefits of data? Mm -hmm. Am I? Yeah, of course. So uh, you're still mic, so if you want, oh, if you want to jump up. Yeah. Um, so for us, it's it, very relevant. And the reason I made a joke earlier, um, there is quite a bit of scaremongering in the media around open banking and the banks are coming to steal all of your data and what are they going to do with it? Um, there's one piece about comms in general and what are we communicating to the general public. But actually, um, in my opinion, at the end of the day, um, it's not so much that customers are concerned with open banking or open data. What they're more concerned about is what is the value exchange that I'm getting? Oh, should I? Into the spotlight. Um, what am I getting in exchange for? If, if I am actually able to save money on my utilities. If you're Still more. Sorry. <laughs> Never been spotlight shy, all of a sudden I am. Um, if they're able to get something out of it in exchange, I mean, think about it. When you're at the airport and you hand over all of your personal data because you want what? Wi-Fi. Right. If you think that's a fair value exchange, that's great. Um, ultimately, you go, it'll be up to the customer. And if we're able to do some of these journeys that I kind of showed you just here, then we feel that it is a, a fair value exchange. Um, and we just need to continue to give customers that value to build that trust and hopefully not break it. So my view, just picking up on that, the question, is around clarity. So the words... The, the, the stuff's buried down in the bottoms of the terms and conditions and sometimes you might get to it, you probably don't read it, you just click through. I think there are examples um, of where the, the permissions that you give or the permissions that you take are really clear and communicated well. I think there's a, there's a huge piece of work there to actually work on making it really clear what you're signing up to when you click that box. Um, it has been in the interests, in my view, of companies to be slightly opaque um, I think that things will change, and it's that's that's the real the real shift will be that. So any, anybody else want to? Res any other questions? Yeah. Just, just really following up from the previous question, um, when I, I give consent, I might give consent to a company to use the, my data for their particular needs, but. In the example of, of BUDS, you are sharing that data then with a multiplicity of third parties. So h how do I control which third parties you can share that data with and which, which you can't? Consent. Um, 
Should, should I get yeah. back? Okay, sorry. In the sorry, okay. So, um, like I said before, with the user flows, um, again, it comes down to regulation and, and mandates. In our industry, there are mandates. There is regulation that states that we do need to present you with the fact that we are going to share exactly these pieces of information. Um, I'd be happy to show you what that looks like um, later, but there are actual roadblocks that say, do you consent to sharing your name, your address, your date of birth with this third party, and then moving that forward. Um, I, I can't really speak to industries where it's not regulated, though, and perhaps you could. Anyone else? <laughs> I mean, I think it's maybe a little bit different in the open active space because it's not about, at the moment, it's about the opportunity data. I think what will be really interesting around the booking stuff is what, when, you, when you move beyond that. So at the moment, you are, you, we are share, it is about the organisation sharing the opportunity, but we do want to have an integrated system where you can book, and then clearly you are getting into personal data. So, um, but I think, it, yeah, it's, it, We've got to assume, haven't we, that individuals have a kind of yours have a responsibility. It's a bit like the point about the Wi-Fi at the airport. No one's compelling you to do that. You just decide you want to do it because that's something you're used, willing to have. And to some extent, that, 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 that kind of applies to a lot of these things, I think. Um, so just being very clear about that, I think, um, is the key bit. So I'm going to call time on our session there. So um, can we just thank everybody? Thank you. And I'll come back to Alex. Thank you to all our brilliant speakers for the insightful um, sharing of their open data journey so far. Um, before I let you all go, I am going to remind you about becoming a member again because we love all of our members and you get to come to events like this um, and you, you, you become part of our peer network and can collaborate with, with other organizations who we work with as well and obviously with, with the ODI. Um, and lastly, there are ODI, uh, ODI Summit tickets left, so um, speak to any of the ODI team if you are looking to purchase a ticket um, and members get 30% off. Um, but thank you everyone, there, is, there are refreshments outside and we've also got some demos um, on display as well, so go and take a look at those. But thanks everyone for coming.